G'day, I'm Dr. Kev, and in this video we're going to look at the conceptual design of the front suspension for Project 171. Welcome to Car Design Workshop. The suspension system of a sports car is going to have a large impact on its handling, its grip and the comfort of the vehicle. This is a system that is going to need a lot of design work. And in this video, we're just going to be starting with one corner of the suspension and looking at a conceptual model. This conceptual model will give us an idea of the space required for the suspension system as well as the cost and weight of the components. What we're seeing in this video is going to need a lot of refinement as we start to do uh, geometry calculations, load calculations, as well as mechanical design of the individual components. And a lot of these topics are going to be covered in future videos. So keep in mind that nothing that we're seeing here is absolutely finalized, except for a couple of the components that I've already gone out and purchased. Now, if you know your suspension systems, you'll see that what we have here is a double A-arm suspension system or a double wishbone suspension system, depending on which side of the pond you live. This arrangement allows for quite a lot of flexibility in the design. It's not common in road cars, which generally use McPherson struts more for packaging than performance. But on a custom car, it's probably the most common choice. Now it's pretty handy when designing a car to work from the outside in. Nearly all of the work of the car is happening at the tire. Realistically, the chassis of the car, the main structure, is really just a big bracket to hold these tires on. And the goal of the suspension is to control the load and accelerations on both the unsprung and sprung masses and also the orientation of the tire, the geometry by which the tire is going to move relative to the chassis. So if we look through the components that we see here, we really start on the outboard with the wheel and tire. Now if we were covering this from the position of say a race car, we would consider the tire to be uh, one of, if not the most important component on the car. But I would argue that on a sports car, it's maybe not the most important component. And that's not because the tyre doesn't have a large influence on the performance of the vehicle. It's really just that once you have a wheel size, you are going to be able to change your tyres between different makes. So getting the perfect tyre for the very first time the car goes out, it's not really something you need to be overly concerned with. You will be able to test a variety of different tyres as, as you're working through it. Now this is a, a bit of a bonus because we don't really have tyre data for these. Most of the manufacturers for tyres are going to just sell you a tyre based on uh, marketing and hopes and dreams rather than hard data. And if you look through online discussions, you're going to see a lot of people discussing which tires suit which cars. And there's a lot that can be gained by that empirical discussion. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to go through that process of tuning the car for the particular tire towards the end of the project. Now I've modeled these tires just here without any tread pattern. That's not indicative of what the final vehicle will be. Not intending that this is a race vehicle running on slicks. It's just to save a little bit of modeling time. I haven't actually chosen the exact tire that's going to be used at this point. With the tire, we also have the wheel, and I think that's a very important decision that you need to make. The size of the wheel is going to dictate how much space you have inside for packaging things like your brakes, your uprights, and your suspension. So setting the wheel size early is going to be something that really affects the rest of your design and the suspension system. In some ways, it affects it more than the tire choice will. As the wheel size goes up, the weight of the wheel and tires are going to also increase quite a lot. A small wheel and tire package is going to mean smaller brakes, but also lower weight. So finding that balance is actually quite difficult. Now, tentatively, I've set this at a 15 inch wheel. At this size, there's quite a large tire variety. It still leaves you a lot of space to package things inside while keeping it fairly small. Another thing to consider with wheels is that they affect the appearance of the car quite a lot. I'm likely to go backwards and forwards on the choice of wheels. At the moment, I've modeled these as Ray's Volk TE37 wheels. 
These are a forged wheel, they're quite lightweight, they're also reasonably expensive. I'll almost certainly go back and have a look at these wheels as I'm doing a lot more of the body development later in the project. Now if we move a bit further in, we hit the brake system. I've modelled these initially as Willwood parts, so a Willwood cast iron disc with an aluminium hat to save a little bit of weight, and also a Willwood caliper. Now while the Willwood brakes are a good product, I'm not settled on the final choice of these components. Until I have a really good idea of the centre of gravity location of the vehicle as well as the weights, I can't really do detailed brake calculations. And so I've really just put a disc that I think fills the wheel quite well. These are at 280 mils in diameter. And I will be trying, if possible, to keep the discs the same, or a lot of these components the same, on the front corners as well as the rear corners. I've also chosen at this point a Venter disc, although I think that if the car ends up being quite lightweight, you could get away with solid discs. Now when it comes to brakes, we're also seeing one of the big differences between road cars and race cars. In a race car, the brake applications are quite aggressive to start with, so you've got very hard on the brakes and then a, a quick and controlled release, compared to a road car where we're comparatively very gentle on the brakes, and with a lot of time between braking events. So this is one of those components and one of those systems where we really have to decide is this more of a road car or is this more of a track car? Now if I end up running a good size vented disc, this is a system that shouldn't give us any issues if we want to use it on the track quite a bit. May have some issues building up good temperature on the road. But a lot more work to be done here. Now further in from the brakes, we find a hub and bearing. Now these we can buy as a single sealed unit. There's a lot of different ways to do bearings and spindles and bearings and hubs on a car and some are a lot lighter than using these units but they're incredibly practical and what I've done here is selected the same unit as you would find on a Series 2 Lotus Elise. I'm expecting that Project 171 will be at or below the weight of a Lotus Elise, so components from an Elise suit this car quite well. The unit I will use will have a sensor on each corner built in. Now in a road car, these sensors are used for ABS. I do not plan on having anti-lock braking on this car, but the sensors provide a way for us to use traction control on the vehicle, which is definitely something that I want to investigate using. When running through the specifications of this vehicle, I indicated that I would be wanting to use a donor vehicle for a lot of the components. Given that the engine is going to be from a Subaru, it makes sense to be getting components from an Impreza, the, the smaller of the Subaru vehicles. Now one downside with using a Subaru in this in environment is a lot of the suspension components are actually quite large and it's a McPherson Strut suspension system, so some of them are just not that suitable at all. And one difficult decision to make was around these bearing units. Now in the end, I've gone for the Elise components. They're readily available, they're quite lightweight, but one of the big advantages is it drops it from being a five stud or a five wheel bolt arrangement to a four wheel bolt arrangement. And this actually has a reasonable weight saving in it. Now the hub and bearing unit is attached to the upright. And this upright is really just a bracket for all of the suspension components. It's something that you spend a fair bit of design in, one because it's fairly heavily loaded, but mainly because it influences the steering geometry and the load uh, transfer under cornering and braking through the vehicle. Small changes to the geometry of the upright when it comes to the wishbone locations where it mounts to the upright can have a sizable impact on the handling of the vehicle. Now a lot of custom cars, this will be a component that you will you'll buy off, say a, an old Triumph or a Ford Escort upright or an MX-5 upright or something like that. At this stage, this is a component that I'm looking to design so that I can 
choose the geometry that I want on this car rather than being forced to adapt uh, to a different vehicle. Now this is a fairly blocky initial attempt, but one of the things I do need to keep in mind with these sorts of components is a really good detailed lightweight upright can end up taking a lot to manufacture. So I want to try and keep the designs of these components fairly simple. Now there's two main materials and manufacturing methods you might want to use here. Uh, one is to use a fabricated steel upright and the other is to use a machined aluminium upright. Now I've drawn these as a machined aluminium upright. It has a little bit of a downside in that you need to be much more careful around your design for fatigue. So any sharp corners, some of which are in this design at the moment, but will be fixed. Any sharp corners can be a stress razor, which can cause a fatigue failure. This is something you can work around through good application of mechanical design. And there's plenty of cars out there running aluminium uprights. Now off the uprights, we have our double A arms. Now they're either called A arms because they're in the shape of an A or they're called wishbones because they look like a, a wishbone of a chicken. Structurally, wishbones are quite efficient you end up taking the loads that are fed into the ball joints and distributing through the legs of the wishbone in really tension or compression. There's not a lot of bending that goes on there, at least if the suspension arms are designed well. Now some cars, including road cars that use double A arms, can often use an aluminium component here, but I think for this car, much more suitable material is to use a fabricated steel wishbone. There's no real need to go to a high strength uh, steel here. We'll do some calculations on loading of these a little bit later on in the project. For the bearings attached to the upright, I'm using the ball joints that are used both top and bottom on a Lotus Elise. And as long as the car is about the same weight as an Elise and the dimensions of the upright are somewhat similar, which they are, then these ball joints will be more than adequate for this task. I could save a little bit of weight here by making the ball joint for the upper wishbone slightly smaller because it will be loaded a little bit less, but I think the advantages of keeping these components exactly the same uh, outweigh any minor weight benefit that you might get. On the inboard of the wishbones, I've decided to use a bush instead of a spherical bearing or a rose joint. Now this just gives a little bit more compliance at this joint, which should give us a slightly less harsh uh, ride of the vehicle. If we wanted absolute accurate positioning here, a spherical bearing would be a better option here. But given this is predominantly a road car, not a track going car, I think the bushes suit quite well. And again, for ease of selection here, I've chosen a Lotus Elise parts and I've already ordered these in. It's pretty important when we're doing this modeling to have some of the basic components on hand so you can do your measuring, get a sense for the size of the components that we're working with. Now the last component you'll notice here is the damper. I haven't modeled a spring on here. I haven't even decided close to what the uh, spring rates on this vehicle are going to be. Those are calculations for a little bit later. But I wanted to put a damper in here just to get an idea for clearance and how I'm going to orientate these different components. I haven't decided which damper I'm going to run. I contacted a, a number of different companies and this one here is a model that was provided by Penske. Now this particular damper has adjustment on both when the suspension is being compressed and when the suspension is being extended or is in rebound and would likely be a suitable unit. So with all of these components, I've got the masses in the model about as accurate as I can. I've also included most of the fasteners, so this should be a fairly accurate weight for what this corner will be. And at this stage, without the spring on there, this corner is about 28 kilos. Now that number's not final, but it gives a bit of an indication when we move forward and do some other calculations what sort of range we're likely to be in. And I have had to do some estimates of component weights that I don't really have access to at the moment. So I've estimated weight for the, uh, the tire based on a little bit of research online and also put an estimate of weight for the damper. But nearly all the other components are straight from the manufacturers or in the case of the components that I've bought, they've been individually weighed. The components like the upright, which are homogenous, 
uh, single material components. When you model them, you get really good mass uh, accuracy from the model. And so things like the bolts, the uprights and so on, those masses have come from the modeling process. And it's pretty interesting to go through and see what contributes most to the weight. For example, we might spend a fair amount of time on the upright trying to reduce the weight. It's a heavily loaded component. We do want a lot of strength and stiffness from it, but we also want it to be lightweight. However, it only accounts for 4% of the total front corner weight. It's not a component where spending a huge amount of time is going to have a huge overall benefit to the car. And similar to the uprights, the wishbones that I've modeled, even though they're not going to be the final versions, they're fairly close to what the final ones will end up like. So they only account for 7% of the weight. There's not going to be a lot I can do to reduce the weight there from what's already modeled. Now, I could have saved a little bit of weight in bushes and ball joints and fasteners, but again, very small components. The really big areas to save weight on this corner are going to be with the wheel and tire and the brake caliper and brake disc. Looking at the brakes, we have just over 20% of the weight in the front corner in those components. So when we're doing the calculations on the brakes, we need to be asking, is there a possibility that we could go to a solid instead of a vented disc? Or can we run a smaller caliper? Or could we reduce the outer diameter of the brake disc? And that could have a noticeable effect on the weight of the corner. But when we see that 43% of the weight of this corner is caught up in the wheel and tire, it becomes pretty clear what is going to have the largest influence on weight in the suspension system. It's pretty difficult to see how we might even try to match the weight of a Lotus 7 style vehicle that might have a 13 inch wheel when we're putting on a 15 inch wheel with a 15 inch tire around there. Likewise, we might be tempted to go for a larger tire, a wider tire to get a bit more grip, to make some more space for bigger brakes so we can slow down more. But this is going to have a knock on effect to this whole corner. Not only do we make the wheel and tire bigger, but then the uprights, the wishbones, the brakes, all of these components need to be upsized. And so the weight could very easily go from sort of a 28 uh, kilo corner up to 50 kilos. This model that we've been looking at is the front left corner. Now the front right corner is pretty much a mirror image of this. When it comes to the actual modeling, I will create separate parts. I don't feel that the, the mirroring components in uh, SolidWorks is, is fantastic when it's applied to assemblies. I often end up with mistakes and things not quite the right way. So I much prefer to just have a, a handed version. And because a lot of the components on here, so the hub and bearing, the bushes, the ball joints, and even hopefully the, the wheels and brake discs are the same on the front as what they're going to be on the rear, it's a pretty small step to go from a single front corner up to a four corners on the vehicle. This is only just the very beginning of the modeling of the suspension, and we really haven't touched the calculations yet there's a lot more still to go in this area we need to look at the geometry we need to look at the loading we need to do uh, stress analysis on components a lot of really fun stuff uh, still to come and as we go through that process a lot of the dimensions here are going to change it's great to have a model at this stage it allows us to do a little bit more chassis modeling a little bit more calculation and to move forward with the project and that's really what this design process is. There's a lot of backwards and forwards as one design decision starts to knock on and affect others. So I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to the conceptual design of the suspension for Project 171. And I hope you look forward to some of the future videos when we start to dive deeper into the different design aspects of these components and as we start to put it together to a full vehicle suspension system. Thanks for your time.